In order for robots to operate in the messy world that we live in, we're going to have to give them better bodies. So I hope I'm not being too offensive here, but humans are better than robots. No one's offended. OK, so no robots in the audience. Good. Uh, so why, though? We have hundreds to nearly a 1,000 skeletal muscles in our body that help us move with fine or large motions at high speed and high forces at great efficiency. Robots have tens of actuators. You can think of them as artificial muscles. And they have to choose to be either fast or strong, have high efficiency or low weight. Muscle makes a much better compromise between these features. We have veins and arteries that deliver energy-rich blood to power our muscles. We're full of energy. Robots have a few power cells. Most of the time, they're batteries. And they're not very big. The bigger you make them, the heavier and more unwieldy the robot is. So if you unplug it, it can either not do much or it can't do it for very long. We have a nervous system that collects information from tens of thousands of sensors, feeds this information to our brain, and allows us to respond and control our hundreds of muscles to adapt to our environment. Robots have a centralized controller that reads information from a few sensors into a controller that then tries to use these, at most, tens of artificial muscles to adapt to the environment. So you can see that robots really don't have a chance next to us. But why is this? There's one reason that we're grown from the bottom up using material chemistry, and they're assembled from the top down using machinery. We're grown, and they're assembled. But so what you say, I've seen YouTube videos of robots doing backflips and arm wrestling and doing the Macarena. So robots are agile. And that's true, and it's really impressive um, and very useful. But if you unplug them from the wall, they can't really do it for very long, definitely not as long as we can. Tomorrow, there's going to be NFL games, and we're going to see super athletes compete for an hour and a half, not against immovable objects, but against other super athletes. Again, robots do not have a chance. But even some of you in the audience have robots that can do useful work for a long period of time. Uh, they're called autonomous cars, and they are enduring. The reason they are is we've put wheels on them and paid about a trillion dollars to engineer our landscape to be flat. So right now, we have a choice. We can have robots that are agile or enduring, but not both. Organisms make a much better trade-off. We still have to make the same decisions about agility or endurance, but we do a better job of it. Even plants do. This is a video of palm trees in a hurricane. What's happening here is the palm tree is doing a calculation without a brain or a controller. Wind is inputting information, and the branches and leaves are moving away from the wind so that they don't break. After the wind stops, the branches re-extend, the leaves unfurl, and it starts to gather sunlight so it can live and grow. And even if a branch does break, it can grow again. What's happened here is that this plant has grown and adapted to the environment using material composites. That brings me to the first of two points I want to make. What we need to do is synthesize new materials for robots specific to the purpose of being a robot. Right now, we assemble components from materials designed for other purposes. And then we expect the robots to go up out their business and be fine, but they're not. Using biology's inspiration, we should be making robots out of soft and hard materials. And I work in a field called soft robotics, which is doing exactly this, trying to design new materials for robots so they can be more adaptable and enduring. This is a gripper that I've made, made out of silicone rubber. And as I pressurize it, it's doing what the palm tree did. It's using, you could call it a material intelligence, to feel and automatically respond to the thing it's grasping. It's adapting to the complex shape so it can find a better way to grasp it and lift it up. This means it applies less force, so it's unlikely to damage this vegetable. So there's obvious applications in agriculture, but there are other ones too in terms of human-robot interactions. If we want to work more closely with robots, and we might for things like elderly care and manufact assistive manufacturing, we'll want these robots to definitely not harm us. And soft robotics is a way to do that. This is a mobile robot I've made. 
I can cause it to stand up. I'm controlling this and causing it to move, but it can't get through this obstacle. So now I'm causing it to undulate. And what I find both uh, <laughs> inspiring and infuriating about this is that I made it, I'm controlling it, but it's a better dancer than I am. <laughs> I've tried to dance, and I look like a robot. So there's some kind of irony or par paradoxical thing going on here. But anyway, uh, my job is to make robots better, and I think this is working. <laughs> so I've been calling this a robot, but it's actually not. It's a machine. In order to turn this into a robot, we need to put sensors and controllers and other things inside of it, and it starts to become really complicated. Unfortunately, I think we need to embrace complexity because we're not going to have adaptable and enduring robots without it. So instead of assembling robots, we need to grow them. We're very complicated organisms. We have different organ systems that perform multiple functions and interact with each other with other organ systems by transferring information and energy. And this is all done in a very small volume. So it's hard to imagine assembling a robot from top down to get the same level of complexity we do, which I think is necessary for being able to operate for a long time in a generally adaptive way. So it's also unlikely that in the short term, we're going to be able to assemble proteins into something like organs for robots. But what we can do is use 3D printing, which has developed a lot in the last 30, 20, and 10 years. This is a projection stereolithography 3D printer that you can buy commercially from a company called Carbon. We're growing, in this video, 25 <laughs> transmission systems out of a black liquid. And these transmission systems are made of rubber, and they're really kind of a complex shape that it would be hard to make in another way besides 3D printing. But this is just the start. We're going to get much more complex, and we'll bring this up later too. But we can now also print electrically conductive material. This is a transparent jelly bear that we printed. It looks a lot like Cornell's mascot touchdown. Um, and we're going to stab it with this LED. And we're also going to shock it to make this LED glow. But I promise the bear didn't complain in either case, which is helpful when you're dealing with uh, robots. Um, so anyway, we cause this LED to glow. And this is a simple demonstration, but you can imagine making a fractal network of this stretchable conductor inside the body of a robot that can transmit information between robotic organs, energy between them, and even store energy to help these, this endurance versus adaptability and agility trade-off. So we've combined these ideas of 3D printing and soft materials to make this hand that helps solve a problem in prosthetics. Right now, if you're trying to get a prosthetic hand, a powered prosthetic hand, you're probably going to have to choose between something that grasps slowly with high force or quickly with low force. Now, what you would like is something that can do both. And because, remember those transmission systems we printed earlier, they're very small, and we can pack a lot of them into the palm of this hand. So there's six transmission systems in this hand, six motors, a battery pack, and a computer, all because we 3D printed this and can pay a lot of attention to the architecture in the inside. So it can now grasp something that's thrown at it and grasp it with enough force to do useful work. You can see on the fingers, there are these little white pads. And those white pads actually can see an object coming at it and then tell the controller, now it's time to grab it. The same pads can also tell how much force they've grabbed it with. And because it's made of the soft material, it doesn't have to be very precise. So it can still grab things without grasping it exactly like you would try to do with a traditional robot hand which is also, by the way, how we work. We use imperfect information to interact effectively with the world around us. So we took this example of sensing from the surface and put it throughout the volume of a robot, making sort of like a robot meat. These are sensors that we've threaded through a printed lattice, and they're based off of light, so that's why they're glowing. But as they move, it sends information to the computer, and then the computer guesses at what shape it should be in. This is like, imagine a piece of steak where the red part is muscle, the white part is fat or energy, and inside that you can actually, there are actually nerves that are less obvious. But we're trying to put nerves in our muscle. Okay, so but why, and this is a hammer smashing it too, because it's soft, you can do these kinds of things. Um, this is my student pressing on this robot meat and then getting on the right side 
all the data out of it. That data is then fed into a computer, and then the computer guesses of what shape this cylinder should be. And it does a really good job. She's designed the cylinder so that it collapses in the middle first, and that's what we see here. And the accuracy to which this does it is as good as if we were touching our back and trying to find the position of where we're touching it. We've fed this information into uh, the sensing ability into artificial muscles for an agricultural application. This hand is made of soft muscles, so it's not going to damage these tomatoes. It can feel their position. This is all done without vision. And then it's going to press on each one, and then the amount of force it takes to press on it will be used to let us know which is the least stiff tomato, which is also the ripest one. This is an obvious application, but a, another one for why we want robots to be able to feel themselves is if we want them to be enduring and work in the environment for long periods of time, they're going to accumulate damage. Now, if I break my ankle, I don't just stand there for a month and let my ankle heal. I get crutches and I adapt to this and I start moving. In the same way, robots can use these sensors to adapt to damage they accumulate so they can still be useful. So this is an example of a, a robot hand, but I've talked about agility, but now we want to talk about endurance. How do we make robots last longer? Um, this requires an even more complicated engineering effort. Uh, we created a robot vascular system. So in the red in this diagram is a liquid battery that's being pumped through this robot fish. And this liquid battery is powering artificial muscles that is causing the fish to swim. This same liquid battery is also powering the pump that's moving the liquid battery. And we use this in a way like we use our own blood, where our blood powers our skeletal muscle. The same blood powers our cardiac muscle, which pumps our blood. Using this, we created this robot fish that can swim for 400% longer than it could without this vascular system. So using material science, we've been able to increase the adaptability, agility, and endurance of robots. And I just hope that I've convinced you that material science is a doorway to better robots. Thank you.